Africa, we know, is grappling with a health crisis and a sharp economic contraction as a result of pandemic lockdowns. Nevertheless, the early predictions of famine, economic and social collapse on the continent were clearly overblown. Now, when the speakers on our next panel, they were all old friends. When they finished recording our conversation, they actually kept talking and they ended up having a fascinating conversation while our cameras were still rolling. And we thought we'd start there. The conversation. We are pleased to welcome speakers Aliko Dangote, founder and co-chairman of Dangote Group, Grasa Michel, chair of the Mandela Institute of Development Studies and former Mozambique Minister of Education, and Strai Masayiwa, founder and executive chairman Econet, an African Union spe special envoy with moderator Zain Bergi, who is founder and CEO of the Zain Bergi Group. What happens when you put three of Africa's top leaders in a room to figure out solutions? The conversation is real, it's dynamic, it's forward thinking, and a little bit humorous. Hey, Gracia, you. you look radiant uh, as usual. I'm going to tell the girls that you are still number one on fashion. <laughs> That's very kind of you, but you know, <laughs> me, I'm here always, I mean, speaking on the human face of all these tragedies and the human capacity of response. That's my strength. And I think that's what really, with a continent like ours, there's no substitute. <laughs> you will live forever. <laughs> <laughs> we need you, you need us to, 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 to continue to lead without your support as a private sector, but supporting our heads of state and our ministers, etc. I mean, we wouldn't be where we are. And it was important to tell this to the world, what Africans have been doing for themselves. Of course, with connection and with support of the rest of the world, but what Africans have been doing for themselves. So that's a, a strong message. And I think it's part of the reason why we didn't reach the levels of tragedy which were being anticipated. Yeah. yeah. And you know, every yeah. single thing that people have tried to say to explain why our numbers are, are so low, you end doesn't add up. You always end up in a place. You know, I finally said to somebody, you know, if you tell me it's a miracle, I will accept. Because when we started, the numbers, the projections, what we were dealing with was just terrifying. Yes, uh, yes. And the, you know, people said black people will not die, but black people died in America. They died in, in mm -hmm. Brazil. Uh, mm -hmm. they, say, they say, oh, because your people are young, but we still have 500 million people, old people, you know, so mm -hmm. um, the thing is, but it's been know, an uh, absolute miracle. Stry, when you look at it, you see that uh, a lot of us were all used to malaria. A lot of people will always have malaria and they'll be going around without them knowing that they really have, uh, you know, malaria. And part of the system uh, is actually having malaria. And I think uh, there must be something with our DNA that has actually helped in terms of protecting us from uh, dying from COVID. Uh, some people say that, no, no, because we are not testing. I say, okay, even if we are not testing, you would have seen retinue of people lining up at hospitals complaining about fever or coughing or whatever, you know, and we don't have that. All the hospitals, in fact, to tell you the truth, now 90% of the isolation centers that we built they are closed down. You know, we don't have any, uh, you know, I mean, people have recovered. We only have uh, less than uh, 1,200 people or so that are still, you know, in isolation centers. We, we still have to, to, to dig deep to understand the impact that we have been going through one pandemic after the other pandemic and the other pandemic without the world realizing that Africans are going through all these many pandemics, which is the malaria, which Alip is talking about, HIV, which uh, we all know and the strife spoke about. I mean, deprivation in which we have been living, it's another pandemic. And all these things perhaps have developed 
along the times some sort of resilience in us. It is true that what was anticipated for to have people lining up to go to hospital, it didn't happen. Perhaps there are people who are being infected, but they continue to do their life as if they were not infected, as they continue to do with their life with malaria, with HIV, with the hunger, with, you know what I mean? So all these factors, but I think it's too early for us to, to know exactly how we had this kind of resilience. It is true that we are not out of this, uh, um, of this pandemic, but the problem is that some parts of the world are beginning to uh, design and even to redefine what is the post pandemic. And I think we have to be doing both. While we still have to continue to save lives, we need also to be saying, how is it going to be in a way we don't continue to do the things like before because the post COVID is being planned, is being redesigned, it's being re restructured across the globe there are already people who are thinking of that. And we need to have ourselves already doing both, saving lives, but thinking what we have to do best from lessons we have so that the future is not going to be like yesterday and the future is not going to be like today exactly. So it's, it's just to, 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 to play with the ability. And I wanted to say something which is also very important. I didn't say before, women's leadership. You know, it's not by chance that countries which did best globally, they were led, they are led by women. And I think that's important also. In our case, we need to look at how women's leadership is to be side by side with men. I'm not saying that we have to throw away the men. <laughs> but I think one of the issues is to bring women's leadership at the center as well of the post COVID, of the reconstruction and the reshaping of what our continent is going to look like in future. Let me tell you one of the big lessons here. When the Ebola crisis occurred, okay, yes, yeah. the then chair of the African Union was Dr. Nkosazana Zuma from South Africa. And she called me and she said to me, we need an African response. Can the African private sector help? I reached out to the African private sector. And I, what many people don't know is there were seven envoys then, all from the private sector, which included myself and Aliko. And what Africa learned at that time was the leadership reservoir that sits in the private sector to act, respond, and support. So on this occasion, the president just had speed dial to a group of us. And for example, Aliko's group sitting in, in Nigeria, we work very closely with them. And these groups, we have uh, uh, the guys in Kenya, um, all working together, their private sector. So the most beautiful lesson for Africa from this has been that it can rely on its private sector. In the past, it was believed that we were just there to make money. The population no longer sees it that way. They see us as entrepreneurs, as an integral part of the society, able to drop what we are doing able to make serious uh, sacrifices to go out and to help, to use what we have. So, it's, so I think this is really, really important because even if you look at the current group of seven envoys, we're all private sector people um, and we work very, very comfortably with the governments. Of course, some of my colleagues like uh, uh, Ngozi, uh, great woman leader, as you know, um, uh, and Tijan Tiam and uh, Donald Kabaruka and Trevor Manuel. Okay, these are all great leaders who've been in government and been in the private sector. But I think that's a big takeaway. You can trust your private sector. That's the lesson that Africa has taken from this. 
that we are not just there to make money. We are there to build communities, to build livelihoods, and to protect our people. You know, you really, you are right. Uh, during the Ebola, we helped, uh, you know, tremendously. I mean, I remember when you spoke to me, we even gave uh, the African Union, you know, for the three countries, I think it was Guinea, Conakry, uh, Sierra Leone, and uh, Liberia. I think we gave them Liberia. $3 million. Mm -hmm. And apart from that, we built the infectious mm -hmm. center here in Nigeria. So private sector can always come together and say, well, this, we don't really need to look for help outside the continent. And uh, I agree with my sister, you know, Gracia Michelle, that I think we need to really have like a conference to see okay, how do we really get together so that if there is any crisis, we can always just come to uh, the rescue of our continent. And what we generally find as well, because the private sector has stepped forward, you, it's now easier even for partners like Bill, Bill Gates and others who, who work with us. They know how to reach to us and how we work together to get things done. So uh, all in all, I think that um, that's, that's been one of the unsung uh, developments of this situation. Look, uh, when the dust settles, as I say, when we are able to get this thing uh, under control, uh, let's have those conferences. Um, we all would love to talk about what we did right and what we did wrong, you know, so that the future generations can build on that. Okay, we'll look forward to that. What do you think is our biggest challenge right now? Myself. Challenge in terms of what? Oh, the, I'm very the biggest clear challenge on this. The, the, we, the number one challenge uh, Zane is ensuring that vaccines arrive on time and equitably. Okay, the way the whole approach to vaccines, don't be fooled. People have hoarded vaccines in the background and then come and pretended that they, let's now have an equitable conversation about vaccines. Um, so the whole issue of vaccines uh, making sure that there's equitable access on time, uh, which looks at all life as being equal, okay, is the big issue. And we're going to have a big fight about this. And we will continue to have a big fight about it until this thing is over. Mr. Dangote, how has Africa been impacted by COVID? Well, Africa has been impacted by COVID in two folds. One is the uh, human side, and one is the economic uh, side. On the human side, really, because, uh, you know, people normally go out and look for the day's, uh, you know, uh, meal. I mean, people have to work on Monday for their, you know, for their feeding of Tuesday, which means people live hand to mouth, majority of people. And the lockdown really deprived people from going out there to look for their daily, uh, you know, uh, break. So on the economic side, because we have locked down, so even moving from one state to another state became very, 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 uh, almost impossible. So that really impacted us economically. You know, people were not able to operate. People were not, uh, you know, able to uh, know airlines. We are not flying, you know, anywhere. So that really impacted us both human and economically, you know. But I think uh, things have actually, you know, turned out, uh, you know, to be much better now, you know, because this period of 20th of March to end of May was really very, very tough. And that's why we had to intervene as a private sector to do a lot of palliatives because people couldn't really go out there. They couldn't go to the farm. They couldn't go to their factories. So everything was shut down, and that really had a massive impact on the uh, economies of Africa. And it was expected, uh, Grassa Michel, that Africa's health systems were going to be so weak that they would crumble and the continent would be facing utter catastrophe. That didn't happen. It wasn't the case. Why? Remember that Africa was hit by the 
wave of COVID last than Europe. So our heads of states and leaders, they had a bit of time to prepare and taking lessons from what was happening with the catastrophic consequences in Europe. They were aware that we didn't have health systems which were strong enough to lean overly on them. So they invested in preparing people, messaging to people that we have to take care of ourselves. Of course, they have also to take the drastic measure of lockdown. Economically speaking, lockdown was terrible to economy, but it, heads of states, they had to make a choice between saving lives or keeping the economy going. And in my understanding, they made the right choice. They declared lockdowns in most of countries. People continued to be educated. And because of that, preventive measures are the ones which helped Africa really to get out of this conflict with much less death as we have, and even in infection rates which are less than what you could see in Europe and in the United States. So I would say one, lessons learned from those who were hit first. Second, preventive measures which were taken by our, our leaders and investing in messaging and educating people to know that only each one of us and all of us together can prevent a catastrophe and a disaster in people's lives. But economically, as Aliku was saying, the consequences are still going to be with us for much, much long time. Let's dig into that a little bit more with Strive Masiwa, who is one of four African Union envoys dealing with COVID. Can you give us a little bit of uh, behind the scenes insight, some color into what the envoys in the African Union uh, have, have been discussing over the past few months and taking action on specifically with your remit, which is supply chains? Give us an insight into what you've been doing. Uh, thank you, Zain. Um... <clears throat> You know, when the crisis hit, um, I was called by President uh, Ramaphosa, who is the chair of the African Union, the rotating chair. And he asked me to take what is basically a full-time job as a special envoy to help coordinate a continental response. We are actually seven envoys. Um, and we work virtually full time. We are working every single day. We are the ones behind the coordinated response to shutdown, the lockdowns. Uh, we work very closely with the Africa Center for Disease Control, which is part of the African Union. And look, as Gracia pointed out, we, the science, uh, our own scientists were telling us uh, what the threats were and what the dangers were. Uh, President Ramaphosa has a task force of heads of state. Uh, there are 10 heads of state uh, who are the chair of the regional bodies of Africa, the regional organizations, and uh, head also the national, the continental security structures. And we report into that virtually every two weeks and um, so, you know, it's been a lot of work um, coordinating with the governments, with the ministers of health, the ministers of finance. We're trying to deal both with the, uh, the, the crisis of the disease itself, trying to keep down the death rates and doing the testing, ensuring that our nurses and our doctors have PPE and so forth and also the catastrophic economic implications. But I'm sure we can talk about that later. 
Well, let, let's get into some of the work that the private sector has been doing on the continent. As a Kenyan, I'm, I'm very proud to see uh, the unbelievable ways in which the private sector has come together in, in multiple countries and, and different regions. And I would like to look at Nigeria specifically, Mr. Dangote, because you've played a specific hands-on role in bringing the private sector together in Nigeria, partnering with governments as well. Could you describe for us a little bit about what you've done and and how the private sector came together. Well, thank you very much, uh, Zen. I think what we did as a uh, private sector, myself and, uh, you know, a good friend of mine, the governor of Central Bank, what we did was actually to create what you call COVID, which is Coalition Against COVID. And uh, we called some few of our colleagues in the private sector we raised about $112 million, you know, to try and partner and complement government in what they are doing, you know, because things are really tough and government couldn't really do it uh, on their own. So what we did was that uh, we raised $112 million. We built 39 isolation centers, of which the smallest is about uh, 100 beds fully equipped uh, with, uh, you know, uh, uh, all the equipment that you can think of. And then we bought millions of uh, PPEs. I think we bought about uh, almost 12, 15 million of PPEs. Uh, you know, we bought a lot of sanitizers. And then we also do palliatives because we realized that people were actually locked down. They were not able to go out there and feed themselves. So we spent the entire $112 million in building isolation centers and then buying palliatives. The palliatives, what we did, was to target the rock bottom of the pyramid, you know, which is now to, uh, you know, target 5% uh, of the population, which is 10 million people. That means 1.7 million households. And we did uh, quite a lot, giving them rice and other stuff, you know, something that equates to about almost 50 kg per family. And that's what we did. And that really helped quite a lot. And uh, were able to uh, really contain the, uh, I mean, mitigate the hardship, because there was really a lot of hardship during the, uh, you know, lockdown. The other hardship that has had to be endured has been on women, on girls, on adolescents. Uh, globally, it's been quite concerning and devastating in many parts of the world, and, and Africa hasn't escaped that. Grasa Michelle, could you give us some insight into those three segments, women, girls, adolescents, how have they been impacted? I'm glad that you are bringing the human face of uh, this uh, impact, because most of the conversations we listen to, we're talking of people who are affected in numbers, but without really categorizing the impact on people uh, particularly those who are much more uh, uh, vulnerable. Coming to women, you know, the impact on women, I, th I think, is still going to be evaluated in future. It's very hard to say exactly what it means today because not only they lost their livelihoods, but they are the ones who have to provide for their families. And if they can't, put the food on the table, you can imagine what it means to a mother to see her children, I mean, starving and without even going, having where to go. Second, health-wise, for instance, the lockdown meant that women could not go to clinics. And it means we went down in terms of the levels of antenatal programs which were in place. So the increase of unwanted pregnancies, it is still to be evaluated on women. Second, women are not yet being able to care for their own children. They can't take children to vaccinations, for instance. One of the examples is that uh, the, the, the Gavi had to postpone 14 programs of vaccinations. And this impacted women who are mothers who couldn't even take their children to uh, vaccination. 
and the emotional impact on this for mothers, it is not going to be told in numbers, but it is something which they will live with for the rest of their lives. But you asked also about uh, adolescents. You know, the adolescents, we decided to, my, my trust, in fact, we decided to organize uh, a listening series so that more than what we could imagine, we should listen to them, how the COVID is impacting on them. They, some of them, they told us they had to become, from one day to the other, they had to become adults, to care for families, to change completely, I mean, their daily activities because they were locked down with younger siblings and they had to organize their lives, et cetera. The inequality in terms of access to education, one, schools, all schools were closed, but some children could have online learning because they have at home the capacity to do so. But millions and millions of other children who are in poor families, in poor settings, particularly in rural areas, it means completely lost the whole academic year of 2020. And the implications of this, it's something which no one at this point can evaluate what it means, the loss of this opportunity for adolescents to have the education going on. We are told that about 10 million additional child marriages have been taking place during this period. You can imagine, because this is on top of those millions which were normally taking place, in one year only, we have much more 10 millions as, uh, as it is being said. We also have, as anyone else, the impact of gender-based violence. And I put it at the end because it goes, it's a gender, it's for women, but it's also for adolescents. And it's not yet something which we didn't have where to call and women had, to stay in the house with their abusers. And of course, it means femicide also has increased exponentially on the continent during this year. So the impact of COVID, it's not only the numbers I'm talking about, it's the scars which are still in the hearts and the lives and the souls of those who are being impacted and which I don't think we'll have the capacity to help them how to heal and how now to move on. So we still have to look at means and ways of more than the numbers to heal our society, to rebuild our re resilience, to be able to reform the way we are going to take up our lives again in the sense of bringing back sense of normalcy, but also some kind of the equalizing opportunities for everyone, particularly for women, adolescents, and children. Strive Masiwa, Grasa Michelle, Aliko Dangote, thank you so much for your time and for sharing with us a little bit about what the continent is enduring and how the continent is dealing with this crisis. Thank you for your leadership as well in all of this. Asante Sana, thanks. And thank please take care of yourselves. You, Sending a virtual hug. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you, Zane.